Before we begin here, um, let's, I'd like to share a few roadmap points. My colleague, Mimi Bolin, who is a PPL Youth Services Librarian, she's here with us to facilitate the tech side of the program. She has enabled the chat function and will keep it open for a few more minutes and then close it until Lynn and Kathleen finish their presentation. A Q&A session will follow. Please add in questions at any point during the session. Lynn and Kathleen will answer as many questions as time allows. You will see the um, function at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A where you can go in and add questions. Uh, the session will be recorded and the link to watch and share it will be made available. So let's begin. Take it away, Lynn and Kathleen. So thank you so much, Susan and Mimi. We're really delighted to be with you here tonight. Um, these are trying times and it's, it's really a good time to talk and value empathy. What the world needs now, empathy, sweet empathy. You remember the song. So we're going to go to the next slide and just drill down what is going on with the world and why we do need empathy. Empathy can be defined as walking in the shoes of others. And this is something I think, again, with, with Omicron and this continuing coronavirus, something we need oh, to do. So sorry, Lynn. And back one, thank you. Yes. To help with COVID's anxiety, stress, and trauma, we are stressed as adults, but so are the kids. And Kidsbridge works with kids. I'll talk about that later. To honor first responders, nurses, doctors, all those people on the front line, let's have empathy for them and regale them. For those who have less than us, this is a time that really is more challenging. We need to have empathy for those who, who don't have what we have. Black and brown persons and communities, we're pivoting now to anti-bias and anti-racism. Let's walk in the shoes of uh, people who have less than we have. For our kids who are ravaged, for other people's kids, this is a point we're gonna to make tonight. We're a community. We care for other people's kids as well. High schoolers and college students, those precious four years of high school and those precious four years of college, it's just so sad that they're not gonna get that social emotional time back. So we feel for them. For our democracy, empathy is having, is caring about other people. That's what democracy is, right? And other suggestions that you might have, and we'll see what you have to say in the Q&A. Empathy fatigue, yeah, it's a real thing, especially for people there on the front line. So we'll talk about that later. We're, we're hoping you guys will pick up a lot of tips tonight. So I wanna tell you quickly about um, KidsBridge. Uh, Kathleen um, and I have worked together at KidsBridge since 2002. Empathy has really been the foundation. KidsBridge educates 2,200 kids a year. Small group discussions, we're really interested in the social emotional face-to-face. -face. This inculcates empathy, 300 educators a year, preschool through middle school. The time to start having conversations about empathy is really preschool. And evidence-based via pre and post surveys. Evidence-based is a big fancy word for best practice or programs that work. As parents, as teachers, I advise you, we have to be more strategic. You need to have programs that work and are effective. Uh, here's the Kidsbridge mission statement. I'm not gonna read that whole thing. You can read it faster, but what is Kidsbridge about? Bullying prevention, the system of bullying prevention, character education, diversity appreciation, today, anti-bias, anti-racism, and life skills training, pro-social. Next slide. Not going to read all these Kidsbridge activities. You can read them faster than I can say. Social emotional skills. In the olden days, we called it character education. But note the empathy empowerment. Empathy to care about others. Empowerment to know with the skills, the tips, the techniques, how to take action. Some people call it empathetic action or empathic action, but they're a team, right? Feel for others, but then take action for your kids, for your students, for your parents, and for people you may not know. Okay, next slide, Kathleen. Okay, again, evidence-based. KidsBridge measures what we do for those of you who, who see programs in your schools, at your church, at any institution with the time that we have that's so precious now, make sure that your programs work. 
Kids Bridge is evidence based for empathy, stereotype knowledge, so important today, mindfulness, so important with COVID, calming down, reducing stress and anxiety, moral reasoning, who can argue with that, empowerment, what I discussed before, stand up and speak out. At Kids Bridge, we use the word upstander, someone who stands up and speaks out. The golden rule, religious diversity, and then uh, reporting cyberbullying. We need to train our children because they're online with so much social media to report that to adults. And sometimes there are safety issues involved. Next slide. Okay, so empathy makes the world go round. This is something that, that Kidsbridge has. Showing all the other skills and aspects that are really based on a foundation of empathy. Storytelling, gender, again, you can read this faster than I can say. Next slide. So the, one of the most important points I'm making tonight is that you should understand empathy, walking in other shoes, feeling for others is the foundation for bullying prevention. And I'll explain that system later. Empathy, empathic action, empowerment in action, upstander, stand up and speak out. Well, you're not gonna do that unless you feel empathetic, right? For someone, conflict resolution, walk in the other person's shoes. Today, maybe you don't agree, but have a conversation with them, right? Calm it down, have a conversation with someone, maybe even your child, difference of opinion, calm down, walk in their shoes, conflict resolution. And finally, diversity appreciation, which today we, we now call anti-bias, anti-racism. Next slide. So um, I have been, it's been such a blessing and a joy, director of Kids Bridge Tolerance Center for 20 years. It went by very quickly. I took everything I learned and threw it into this book to help you for students, for children, for your significant others to be kind, respectful, and successful. And I'll talk more about how the book can be a resource for you later. And next slide. So what is going on with empathy compared to our generation? Do you think it's increasing, decreasing, flat, or what's going on? So just think a minute what that is. Okay, and next slide. So research tells us it's precipitously declining. So this is a concern for us. It uh, hasn't been measured through COVID. Maybe empathy has risen, though we feel for the other, but um, it is declining. So this is a concern to Kidsbridge um, as educators and for us, whoever is listening, parents, educators. So Kathleen, I think this is a good time to do the poll. We want to know who you are and uh, you know who you are and, and what you do. So let's do poll one and, and find out who we have with us here today. And if you could answer parent, grandparent, teacher, I think we should have had another, but here we are. We'll just get a sense, ooh, somewhat balanced. So I'm gonna end the poll. Yes, it looks like we have a lot of teachers, school personnel, and yeah. a lot of parents as well. And even some grandparents, a good amount That's of grandparents. Very cool, very cool. All right, it's just good to know who we're talking to because we want to grandparents get in there. There's a lot of tips for you tonight. And of course, teachers on the front line. Okay. Very cool. All right, and we'll, we'll save that. And let's do poll two. Let's find out what age group um, your children are. If you're a grandparent, you could say how old the children are you're dealing with or teacher going. Let's see what, what age children we're concerned about. Looks like a lot of elementary, looks like across the board, a lot of eight different ages, but a lot of elementary school and middle school, a little bit of preschool and a little bit of high school. Everybody's concerned. Okay, that's good to know. That's a nice balance. Okay, so we just learned. So thank you for sharing with us. So we just learned empathy um, is declining. So we have to be smarter and more strategic about our conversations, about the time we spend with our children and our students. So let's back up to what's going on with COVID, Kathleen. And we know that you know this. Okay, I think it's the next one. Okay, COVID on children and on yourselves. So you may or may not know, 
that abuse is rising for children and for women. This is now articles are coming out to educational institutions. Not surprising, trauma and stress is rising. Suicide ideation for youth is rising. This is serious. We need to be aware of it. Um, it's something that teachers are aware of and you as parents should educate yourself. It's not the purpose of this seminar. Know what those signs are that your child is depressed. Academic losses. Um, let me see if I can close that. Academic losses. Kids are out of school. Kids are, forgive me, watching too much television, too much media. Losses in self-compassion. Uh, you know, taking care of yourself. Parents are now taking care of kids, working from home. That's very stressful. And I am hearing through the grapevine, talking to educators, that children are now increasingly rude to parents and teachers. So you may have your own theory, but I would say the stress and anxiety is stressing out the kids. I would suggest that they're probably watching too much unmanaged media. And what do they see on television and they see on the internet and on their phones? And little kids coming into the classroom, preschool K, have not been in school, do not know how to act in a classroom, and there is some, there are challenges and problems there, even for the little ones. So we have a lot of work to do, you guys. Moving on. So um, can we teach empathy? So I'm not going to give you the answer yet. Kathleen, can we pull out pull three and see what people think? So can empathy be taught and learned? Not possible. We're born with what we're born with. Maybe a little bit we can teach. Definitely, yes. What do you think? Can empathy be taught and learned? So I love this. <laughs> I love this. Because when I started out 20 years ago, people said, you can't teach empathy. Empathy cannot be taught. And yes, it, indeed, it can be. It can be role modeled. It can be taught. It can be inculcated. You can do it. And it can be fun and engaging for you and your family and your classrooms. Yes, it can. The, um, there are people who cannot learn empathy. And those are the psychotic people who you know really have something wrong with their brains. So um, to empathy can be taught. And now I just want to stop and tell you probably the most important thing I'm going to tell you tonight. When you teach, if you make a commitment 20 minutes a day, 20 minutes a week to teach others empathy, when you role model that, when you have those discussions, you in teaching empathy are teaching empathy to yourself. So I know a lot of you are here tonight for self-compassion. If you engage in this to teach empathy to a friend, who may not agree with you, or a child or a student, in the practice of teaching self-empathy or self-compassion, you will, there is a benefit for yourself. So that's very important to know. The last um, system I want to talk to you about, next slide, is empathy's intersection. So Kidsbridge does bullying, but let's reframe this for those who bully, we don't use the word bullies anymore, okay? It's those who bully, those who cause harm. For this system of bullying and those who cause harm, we have those who bully, we have targets. We do not use the word victims anymore, by the way. We have bystanders and upstanders. Remember, upstanders stand up and speak out. Next slide. So here is empathy's intersection with the system of those who cause harm in the office or in a classroom. Next slide. For those who bully or cause harm, if we can, and we do this in Kidsbridge to teach children empathy, if we can impart more empathy to someone who's causing harm, who has no idea, isn't aware, then that's helpful. For example, I've gotten letters from kids in the Tolerance Center. I didn't realize I was a bully. I didn't realize I was making that person feel harm. If we can use empathy in a more strategic way to help that person understand that they are causing harm. In Kidsbridge, we say little bullies grow up to be big bullies. So let's start younger and teach these children how to be empathetic, walk in the shoes of others. Targets, more compassion, teach them more self-compassion. You don't have to be perfect. 
Um, Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F, -F, and I could put that in the chat, is a guru of self-compassion. I think she's the best in the country with workbooks for kids. Kristen Neff, highly recommend to impart more self-compassion to your students, to your kids, to your grown-ups. And bystanders are those um, who don't act, but if you teach them empathy and then the action, that's a combination, remember, empathy and then to do something, then you can create upstanders. So finally, my last slide before Kathleen takes up, who is the majority here? If you look at the system, and, and I've talked to corporations where they talk about people in the office, I'm asking you and you could say to yourself, who is the majority here? Who is in charge of the system? Well, today, those who bully, those who are mean are in charge of the system. Who should be in charge of the system? the bystanders. And so at KidsBridge and in your life, if we can get people to stand up, speak out, push, push back, we're hoping that in the future, we are raising a generation of children and teenagers who will stand up and speak out. So let's learn more about empathy and some specific tips and techniques from the wonderful Kathleen. Thank you, Lynn. So we are going to kick this portion off with one of my favorite authors, she, uh, Brene Brown. She actually has a great new book out called Atlas of the Heart. It talks about all the different emotions that we have. But this little video I'm going to share with you, and I took this, this is straight on YouTube. Um, you can share this with your kids or family members. She talks about the difference between empathy versus sympathy. A lot of people feel like you know what, I'm going to let Brene explain it. A lot of people feel like, oh, I feel so bad for you. And that's our empathy. Um, let's, let's give Brene a listen. And then we're going to dive into some tips by ages. So what is empathy? And why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is... Ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So I just love her her point of view on that, that to sit with them in it, I think, and it makes us a little uncomfortable sometimes, but it's what really 
increases our empathy. So parent tips, we're going to talk about a few things. Avoid labeling. Um, it can be detrimental to the development. If we label something and the person who's sharing with us or, or we're discussing it with, it's not correct. We have turned them away and they're not going to share again. So we want to make sure that we're not doing that. Carol Dweck has a great philosophy of growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And our growth mindset means I can change, I can grow, I can learn empathy, as, as Lynn was saying with her book, versus a fixed mindset. It is today what it is, and I've, I've reached my capacity, and I can't change, you can't change, the world can't change. And we never want to think that. We can change. We have not reached our capacity. We can always improve. We can always grow. I can always learn a little bit more about you that might make me feel a little bit more empathy towards you. The other one, and we're going to talk about this with a couple different age groups, is describe the behavior or the temporary role. Brene has a Netflix special, and if you have a chance, uh, Call to Courage, it's great. In it, she tells how she um, tells her children they are not a, a mess, they're making a mess. They're not a disaster. It might be a disaster. The car might have crashed, things might have happened, but it's not them. It's the situation or the temporary behavior, or temporary role that we're in, and to not make it that it is us. So growing up standards, uh, Lynn mentioned this earlier, that empathetic action, walk in another's shoes. If you were to actually put on someone else's shoes and experience what they've experienced today, you would absolutely see things through a different point of view. How many times when we see somebody, we see their exterior, and if they look a certain way, we have a certain expectation of them, especially if you put yourself in a grocery store or in um, a movie theater and you just pass someone, you've made a snap judgment. You're not thinking that person stole my seat maybe because they were so distracted by what was happening at home that they just sat down and they just needed a minute. Not thinking, wait a minute, what was going on with this person? One of the things we're going to talk about with all the different ages, rehearse and practice with your child. For some reason, we all seem to think we came into this world in touch with all of our emotions, knowing everything, how we're going to respond to things. And our children are just little flowers and we're going to water them and they're going to grow and just know all of this. And they don't. Rehearse and practice. Um, we're going to talk about the different ages again with that. But as you go through, even if you have adults, it's not too late. You can still rehearse and practice with them. Encourage your child to help targets, listen and support. Now we want them to be safe. We don't want them to put themselves in harm's way, but who is their trusted adult that they can talk to? Uh, KidsBridge does a fabulous job of talking about different actions upstanders can take, disrupt the behavior, uh, turn and tell someone, and it coaches them through because it's not, again, a natural response. Sometimes your natural response is to hide and to pretend to be that bystander. I didn't see anything. I don't know. Um, encouraging our child to intervene with a team. When you have a friend with you, that's why we like to go to the bathroom with a friend, right? Or go somewhere, you know, go for a walk with someone. We just feel better when we're with other people. So if Lynn and I see someone doing something and I say, Lynn, we have to do something, her and I can then team up together and I'm not feeling alone. I'm not feeling like I'm going to then be the target. So being an upstander role model. No matter how old your family members are, even if it's your husband or your wife and you're trying to get them to be a little more empathetic, being that role model, if someone um, holds the, the door open for you, um, saying thank you and holding it for the next person, uh, telling someone have a great day or, oh, you dropped that, let me pick that up for you. Everywhere you go, someone sees you doing those things and then can repeat that behavior, you know, that, that pay it forward sort of feeling. So my world is preschoolers most of, of the time. This is where I live. <laughs> and preschoolers, um, they have no idea about their feelings. They have a lot of them and they overwhelm them most of the time. So one of the things we like to do is we empathize with them. And just like Brene was saying, oh, this looks like it's really hard for you. I, I feel sad because you're sad. Um, name and validate those feelings. Oh, you're stomping your feet. You're crying. Are you feeling sad or frustrated? 
Are you feeling, and they might say no. Are you feeling angry? Because frustrated is very different than angry. Or they might be feeling sad. Maybe they had to end an activity that they really enjoyed. Um, and they're feeling sad that they think they're not going to be able to go back to it. So helping them name and validate it. Oh, I'd feel sad too if I dropped all of my favorite cereal on the floor. Let's see if we can get you more and I can show you how to clean it up. Rather than, yep, that stinks. That really doesn't help them to feel better about what is happening. And back to the video again, sometimes we can't fix it. Sometimes something has happened that we can't fix, especially when our kids get older. But naming those feelings and saying, I understand you're sad, I would be sad too. Naming those actions, like I said, I see you stomping your feet and clenching your fists and your face is turning red. You're jumping up and down. It looks like the, you're acting like you are sad or angry. And talking about others' feelings. Again, you're out at the grocery store. A grocery store is a big learning space. Um, or you're at a park and you see another child throwing a tantrum or a mother yelling or whatever you're seeing. Talk about it. Oh, that, that, that postman looks like he's in a hurry. He looks rushed. I hope he's not feeling frustrated because he has too much to do. Or, oh, that cashier looks very overwhelmed. She has a very long line. Um, can you imagine how she feels? Pretend play, it's a great way to do it. They're playing with their dinosaurs. They're playing with their animals. They're playing with their dolls. Whatever they're playing with, I used to make my son's dinosaurs, um, one of them feel sad. I am feeling so sad today. And the other one would say, what's wrong? That's pretend play with them. Make up a little scenario. No, you don't have to do it all day. We know you've got things to do. You're probably trying to work from home and take care of your house and your other children and get dinner on the table. And let's not even talk about the homework. So, but those little times when they might be playing, interjecting with them, oh, what's happening with that dinosaur? Is he mad at the other dinosaurs because they didn't share their, their cave? Um, one of the things we use at KidsBridge, we start off all of our sessions with it. We should have done it tonight, Lynn, are calming techniques. They're not just for kids. They're for adults. We have a, done adult sessions where the adults say, thank you. I am feeling such a better space now. We talk about slowing down our breath breathing in, counting the breath, breathing out. We talk about shape breathing, making a shape and breathing as you go around the corners, listening to certain sounds. Sometimes people like to listen to rain falling, things like that. Or um, we have a Tibetan sound, the singing bowl that we listen to. It resonates a sound and it just brings a peace over you. Finding those things that work for your child, whether it's counting. The shape breathing is awesome. You just, you can do it on your cheek, you can do it on your hand. You make a shape and you breathe through it. It's a calming technique on your hand. It feels good. I can make a circle and just breathe. We have other little tidbits we use. We have little rain sticks, little glitter bottles, anything that you can do, even a special song. When I was young, I had a song I sang to myself. It was a Sesame Street song, but it helped me come back to my reset space so that I could then react calmly. Show them and include them. Preschoolers are watching you. They're like little mini stalkers. They watch everything you do. So when you're making dinner, if your phone rings and you answer it abruptly, they've now just learned it's okay to be rude to somebody when they answer the phone. But if you say, oh my goodness, I am in such a busy place right now. I'm trying to make dinner and I have a lot to do. Can I call you back when I have a minute later? Yes. Oh, great. Have a great night and hang up. Now they've learned that you can make space for other people. And even in chaos, you can react calmly and include them in it. Mommy's feeling very rushed right now. If you could put on your shoes quickly, then we could get out the door. Let them be a part of what's happening. Then they know, first of all, they can help you in these situations. And they, they know that they can now take part and learn those things themselves. I love this one. Small everyday actions, not just grand gestures. I used to run a food pantry. I love when people bring their kids in and like, we're going to volunteer for the day and we're going to pack food for the homeless and the, and the people who need this food. And that's amazing. But you don't have to wait for that, that time when you're going to do a soup kitchen or something like that. And that's what I'm talking about, a grand gesture. Those small everyday actions of picking up trash on the street, saying good morning to somebody walking by, telling the cashier, have a great night, those little things, or even if they have dropped something, 
oh, you know, honey, you dropped your book bag. Let me help you organize it. Those types of things. We're going to talk a little bit about books in a minute, but stories that show empathy and other feelings. If you're thinking, I can't think of opportunities to talk about this, we have actual books you can read that are pointed towards discussing these types of feelings. So when your kids aren't so little anymore, and maybe the elementary kids, age kids, they're not sitting on the floor playing in front of you, you have to poke your head in there a little bit more. Um, practice active listening with them, and then show them how to do it. We're listening to learn. We're not listening to respond. I work on this with my husband too, so it can be done with adults. <laughs> Good one. Listen to the whole thing, pause, reflect, and then respond. Whether it's a question, a clarifying question, what did you mean when you said that she ran past you in a hurry? Or um, what did you mean when the teacher didn't have time to answer your question? Whatever it is. Um, but then paraphrase it back to them so they know that you understood them, that there's clarity there. We call it mindfulness. It's the calming breathing. It is taking time. I am, I am a yoga person. I, I enjoy it. I do it with everyone who will come into my home and do it with me. Littles, bigs, even my, my mother who's 80. Um, it just gives you that, I know she can move, it gives you that peace that again, you can have that space to respond, that you're not reacting to everything that's happening to you. I love a good family meeting. I, I have friends and, and coworkers that have full on family meetings where you sit around a table and there isn't anything in front of you and you or you might have a notebook and you're actually having like a full on meeting. And that's amazing if you can do that. But you know what? It can happen anytime. It could happen before you turn on your favorite TV show if you watch something as a family. It could happen when you're coming off the soccer field. You know, I wanted to talk to you. Do you let's carve out five minutes to talk about um, our busy schedule on Saturday and how we're going to accomplish all these things or a conflict in the house. I, you know, you and your sister have been fighting a lot. Let's talk about this. It connects you to their feelings and then they can in turn turn that outward to other people, supporting each other having those conversations, eating meals together, bedtime routines, elementary school kids, they still have bedtime routines. They might still get a book read to them. You might, they might be off reading on their own, some chapter books, but poking your head in there. I always found at night before my kids went to bed was when the floodgates opened and all of the stories came out from the day. And I could then say, and, and ask them questions and prompt them. Well, how did that person feel when that happened? How did you feel? when that happened. I would have been a little upset or scared, happy, overjoyed. Um, even happy feelings can, you know, learning to be happy for someone else. We always think empathy for the sadness part of it, but feeling joy when someone else feels joy. Some of us aren't really good with that. Um, and we kind of bring someone's joy down. How do we help them feel joy? Others we care about who have less. We all have someone who needs more than we do even no matter the situation you were in, showing your kids, listen, so-and-so needs, um, whether it's their kid needs a ride home from soccer, or they need some groceries picked up and dropped off, or a prescription, or even their newspaper brought up. Uh, my neighbor, I have an older neighbor, and one of the young boys in the neighborhood, when he goes by the house, he brings the mail and the newspaper up and puts it in the door so they don't have to walk out to the mailbox. That's empathy. That's caring that these people um, are older and might slip and fall coming out. And just those little things, showing them those things that there are people who need us. Admiration for first responders, courage. You know, driving down the street and a police car goes by or an ambulance. My mother used to, she was big on that. The ambulance would go by and saying, there's someone in there who's, who's sick or hurting right now. Or, or you know, the person who's responding, how brave are they to, to be that person that's the first person on the scene? There's lots of times that we can discuss those things with our, our children. Intergenerational interaction, um, whether it's within your family, outside of your family, or you're going to someplace like a nursing home, a senior center, um, and having them understand that people of different generations have different needs and feel things differently. And of course, community service with empathy, especially in my elementary school age kids. Absolutely, they want to get involved. What can they do? Can they do some sort of fundraiser? Can they help with a food drive? Can they do, um, there's pet pantries now because of everything going on with the COVID. There's lots of people who need different kinds of help. Pet pantries, collect pet food, things like that. So our middle school and our high schoolers, 
it gets a little trickier. They are a lot of emotions all at one time. So they are also naturally very self-centered. They're worrying about what's happening to them. So helping them turn outward, discussing those emotions. I know you're feeling very excited or anxious about the big play tryout you have or the game coming up or the test you have coming up or college decisions or life decisions. You know, those decisions start to get heavier and have more weight. But having those discussions still, it doesn't mean just because they're 16 or 15 that they all of a sudden understand how to process all of those emotions. Helping out at home, community, or globally. Kids this age, they like to be involved civically. They like to feel like they've made a difference, that they're important. Um, so giving them something to do around the home that they can be successful at and they can feel then that they can continue on. Something in the community. Uh, even KidsBridge, we have volunteers that come in um, and help us package our calming kits. There's always nonprofits out there that could use a little volunteer help. Um, and if you're in a group, I know I got that plug in there. <laughs> if you're in a group, you can do it with friends and it's always so much better. And globally, the internet has given us the ability to help you know, animals, people, uh, groups of people in other parts of the world. Absolutely help your child research that if they want to and find out what's a good match for them. Praise that empathetic behavior. We know you're busy, but find a way, even if you're driving and you say, you know what, I noticed how you um, treated that person you didn't even know who was walking past us. That was really kind of you. That was, that was empathy. Naming what it is. Describe and label. When you're frustrated and you take a minute to talk to me, you know, those kinds of things, it helps us learn to be kinder to each other. And again, read the stories. We, we have a list coming up for you. Um, if your child reads it and you read it, then you can discuss it. You can ask them questions. I used to try to quick pre-read some books that my kids read. So then I could ask them, oh, what did you think about that part where so-and-so did such and such? And then it's a conversation. And sometimes I didn't get to read the whole book, but I got enough out of it. I could talk to them about it. Um, active listening, again, again, listening to those kids, coach those social skills, time to connect when they still need a ride from you. <laughs> Use that time, real life events. Use the news for good. Use those events happening in the world to um, gain those perspectives of other, of other people walking in their shoes. So increased empathy with reading, multicultural books, diversity, diversity, diversity. The world is not one type of person. We don't all look the same, even the people tonight. We just don't. We're not the same backgrounds. We come from different places. The more we understand each other, the more we can accept each other. We want to have that diversity, whether it's ethnic, anti-racist, um, make it fun. Model reading and sharing. Show them um, why you're selecting something. Discuss the quotes. After you're done reading it, ask some question. How's the book make you feel? What would you do? How's that character feeling? Would you like to change the ending? Things like that. So I have a couple slides real quick. And um, the Princeton Library did share that they have some of these books in their library. They're also going to share their book list. Here's some books from preschoolers, just from the cover. They look super engaging and fun. I Am Human, A Book of Empathy, A Little Spot of Empathy, I Am Empathetic. Empathy is your superhero, superpower. Here's an inside of one of the books, super cute. Definitely engaging for littles. Books for elementary school kids. There's a workbook. Lynn had mes mes uh, mentioned another author that had a workbook. Workbooks are good because you feel like you have some structure with it. Stand in my shoes. Keep talking about walking in other people's shoes. And middle school kids. They have some, you know, some of these you'll notice there are movies. The Wonder is a movie. Bridge to Terabithia, Charlotte's Web. They're all movies too. So if you want to read and watch a movie with them, absolutely fine. Media literacy. When you're watching with your kids, make sure you're discussing, or if you hear them watching a TV show, discuss with them. Hey, that's not real. We wouldn't do that in real life, right? And if you have older kids, you can talk about what's happening in real life versus what's happening on TV. Um, comedies. This is a really good one. Are kids aware of a laugh track? Or are they aware of what's a reality show and what really is reality and what is really just for TV? And discussing the shows, the internet, cyberbullying, cyber what is mean and cruel? 
sometimes they don't understand, like Lim is saying about the bullies, they don't realize that that is absolutely not okay to say to somebody and it would be very hurtful. And we are back to the, the thing that started it all, back to Lynn and the empathy advantage. So thank you, Kathleen. So we, I know we threw a lot at you because there's so many age groups to talk about, but um, so that you don't feel overwhelmed, there are resources for you. So of course, uh, there's book lists um, that are uh, published. They're gonna be on the Kidsbridge website and Princeton Public Library. Um, I just want to introduce you to my book to drill down a little deeper. So I was always fascinated with the intersections of empathy with everything. So in this book, there is uh, more parent tips, strengthening moral compasses, which I think we all know we need to do. Empathy and the media intersect using empathy to understand um, media and social media, of course, which of course is on us today. I have chapters. Um, infant to three, three to six, elementary, middle, and high school, because if you have a high schooler, you're probably not interested in a preschooler. So those intersections of empathy. Of course, I talked before about empathy and bullying, uh, self-compassion and self-empathy. You guys listening, you need to take care of yourselves first, which will make you a better, better parent, grandparent, and teacher. Uh, active listening, we talked about empathy, also intersects with gender. And let's not forget about the pets. Your pet is a, a natural empathy generator, but there are clever ways to use uh, pets in a different way to have these, these discussions about, you know, how is your cat feeling? How is the dog feeling? And to drill down with empathy on those notes as well. So uh, my book is in the Princeton Public Library. It's also in West Windsor Library, the Mercer County system. And next slide, resources. Of course, on the KidsBridge website, we have, when COVID started, we created 70 free face-to-face -face social emotional activities you can do with your family, with your classroom, with your, as Kathleen and I suggest, your spouse or significant other. And then of course, KidsBridge now is zooming into classrooms, into youth groups, teaching social emotional skills, empathy, and empowerment until we can get back in the classroom, our programs are Zoom and Google Meets. So um, we, we thank you for joining us tonight that with your interest in empathy and making the world a better place for all of us, those we know and those we don't know. And Kathleen would be delighted to uh, get some questions in the Q&A. So we're, we're happy, we're here till eight and happy to answer any questions you might have. So I see the book lists are in the chat and in the Q&A, there's a couple of suggestions to us, good suggestions uh, for our polls. So I thank you for that. And then one person wants the data source on the slide. So we'll, we'll take mm. that into mind for the future. Here's a good question, Lynn, how to deal with coworkers who lack empathy. They, I think they go along with the, the spouse, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's not funny, actually. I do talk to corporations and I go in to present about kids and the, the last you know 10 or 15 minutes are how to create empathy with their coworkers. So um, it, it is challenging. So of course, with, with calm at lunch, um, a place where you can have a conversation and listen to each other. Sometimes active listening, you have to really listen perhaps longer than you would naturally want to, but to reflect on that. Um, so I would say there are also many books about empathy in the business workplace. You could read those as well, but I think the fundamentals that of the resources we provided will help you. I will say if there's a safety issue or an abuse issue in the office, you need to go to the HR department. However, one of the techniques we shared with you you don't have to go it alone, right? So here's this coworker who lacks empathy and you're a little nervous sitting down with them, what Kathleen and I've said before, and hey, this is how we coach the kids. Get a friend, get a couple of friends, you know, is uh, blah, 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 is rude or a bully that get a group of people together and try to do an intervention in a way that the person is not overwhelmed, but can realize, 
I didn't realize I was bullying you. I didn't realize I was mean. I didn't realize I was un undermining you. So power in numbers, guys. Don't feel you have to go it alone. It's less stressful. But safety issues, HR, for sure. I hope that's helpful. Kathleen, you want to add anything to that? I, I think I would add some of the techniques that we talked about with kids, naming those emotions. Oh, it sounds like you're very frustrated with what's going on at work. Um, and, and you talk about it a lot. And that growth mindset versus fixed mindset, if you Google Carol Dweck, she has um, some live things that you can in, on YouTube. And if you want to just do a quick listen, um, but she talks about how to kind of help someone who might be in that fixed mindset. And if they lack empathy and they're an adult, chances are that's where they are. They're stuck. They're angry. They're stuck. <laughs> and they need a little bit of convincing that they can open up and they can learn and they can grow. Um, a lot of times people without empathy, they don't like change. I so. would I would echo that. Carol Dweck, W D W E C E C K is a psychology professor at Stanford University and created this concept of growth. Like, you know, we're all changing or growing. Maybe adults change slower than kids and the kids mm -hmm. are changing so rapidly, but do Google that or check that out, Carol Dweck. She really is an inspiration to both of us. So Kathleen, I'm gonna let you take the last comment. Sadly, these are co-teachers at preschool. You're the preschool expert. Oh, I didn't um, see there was more questions. I'm yeah, down. scroll okay. down. So Robin asks, co-teachers at preschool, it sounds like they are not as empathetic to the parents and the children. You want mm. to take that one? Yeah. So I'm a director of a preschool too. So I deal with co-teachers all the time who um, are not friendly to each other. And I have had those conversations with them um, just like we do with the kids. And I will say things like, it sounds like you're pretty frustrated with Susan. Um, tell me what's happening. And I will do small groups, pull them both in and have those conversations with them. How does it make you feel when Su I had two teachers recently, the ones that she never tells me, and I'm a big fan of never always don't say those. How many times did she not tell you she was leaving for lunch and you thought she was still here um, or that she was going to put the, this art equipment away before she left the room and the person will say well it was twice so having them drill down like you were saying and put themselves in the other shoes oh do you always tell sally when you're leaving the room no sometimes i forget too um feeling what the other person's feeling well you know you, ha you know how frustrated you feel when she doesn't do that so maybe you could try to communicate that with her um back to Brene Brown again somebody said she she's an amazing resource also clear is kind saying what you mean meaning what you say it absolutely helps in relationships i would also like lynn said i would ask for a meeting um i would sit down and chat with that person with someone else that it takes the onus off of you that you're the um attack or you're on that person you're you're trying to solve a problem that growth mindset Okay, now they're, they're rolling in and, and we do want to help you. I know, I know, I know, How I know. about a person who has empathy but is drowning? So I, I we know so many people that are hurting. Boundaries. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, you know, have experienced a death mm -hmm. and loss and it, it's really a tough time. So I feel really strongly, Kristen Neff, self-compassion. If you could buy one of the self-compassion workbooks, I know she has one for adults and for teens, is a gift to a person. You, you know, these are real fears. These are mm -hmm. real troubles and challenges. You need to take care of yourself. Um, so I would recommend you look at Kristen Neff, try to coach this person. You are active listening. You are there for this person. And, you know, what? so powerful in the Kids Rich Tolerance Center. This is the most powerful strategy for someone who is being bullied. Just listen. Some people don't want you to fix it for them. Mm -hmm. Just listen that they know one person is there. And Lynn, can I piggyback off of that? I'm Please seeing do. a, a um, consistent theme going with some middle school questions. Middle schoolers, um, Lynn was just saying, just listen. They do not like to be told what to do. They shut you down. They don't want to discuss their issue. It's just not what they're going to do. But listening to them, um, giving them that space to say something to you. And sometimes if they won't talk to you as a parent, 
finding someone else that they will talk to. Is there a youth group leader, um, a coach, a teacher that they're, they're friendlier with or feel connected to? Sometimes talking to someone else is the space they need. It's that growing from their parent, that independence. And sometimes we as parents want them to be that six-year-old who wants to sit and tell us that Susie was mean to them on the playground. And your, your 11-year-old just isn't in that space right now. So recognizing that. So middle schoolers are tough. I've had two. I'm an empty nester now. And so usually, you know, how was school today? And you get a grunt, right? You get nothing. So research tells us that middle schoolers are listening to their friends and their peers. And they are not, li they're sort of listening to us, but not, you know, they're more listening to their peers. So you need to find a time or an activity, a commonality. Um, if it's not at the dinner table, a nature walk, sports, what, is, what are the two things that you have in common and you're walking down the road and a more natural conversation um, transpires rather than what, how was school today and what are you doing? So um, one thing I have on my dinner table is a box of questions and you can buy these, which are just sort of like questions about what's your favorite this what do you think about that? And they're sort of prompts. We call them prompts in education that you're prompting, not talking about the problems and issues and troubles, but you're getting a conversation going. So think right. of some conversation starters for you. And I think these little boxes are online. Um, so and I know you can Five find Below this. has Five Below has some items like that also. Yeah. And they're yeah. like three dollars. But you know, there's also some comments about people who are empathetic and who are overwhelmed. And we talk a lot about the calming techniques for others, but especially for an empath. Um, Lynn and I can both tell you, you need to reset yourself. You need to know how to take care of yourself, that self-care piece, whether you, when you said nature walk, it just reminded me, whether it's taking a walk in nature, reading a book quietly, taking a, a, a bath, just sitting quietly in your car for five minutes, resetting. We can't take on others' burdens if we are so heavy ourselves. So, so let me share a technique we have that we're using actually via Zoom for uh, the children we're reaching out to, middle and elementary school kids, using the senses. So if you are a person overwhelmed, you can do this as an adult using the senses. We ask the kids to run around the house, get a tea bag and use the tea bag, smell, calm yourself down, uh, pick out something beautiful. So I do this. I have, I don't know if you can see because of the thing. I surround myself. This is a picture of uh, mm -hmm. Southwest scene, art, things that you like to look at, put that in an area that you can look at that, smells, cook something, or just smell, you know, something that you like, what I else? Keep feeling, my little hand cream here, yeah. Right, feeling, Kathleen showed you, we, we have the kids trace hearts, right, so they can do that, and what sense am I, oh, listening, listening. music, right, beautiful things, so, so that's a way that somebody can evoke self-compassion for themselves. Uh, what else do we have when it's a close relative? Okay, well, that's a little bit more challenging, but we all have those relatives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes, you know, you're going to disagree. So seek for the commonality, seek for something that you both enjoy together. Um, some people are just not going to change their minds. We, we try to evoke empathy try to walk in their shoes. But also you could say, I think in a non-threatening way, I would like you to walk in my shoes. This is how I'm feeling now. I feel. Kathleen, can you build on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think it's okay to say too, that sounds really hard. And um, it's heavy for me to, to hear this. And I, I, yeah, I need to express how I'm feeling. Those I statements, um, you're not saying that what you're feeling is wrong. You're just saying it makes me feel this way when this happens. Um, I'm also thinking someone else had commented, it's hard to practice at self-compassion. I think this goes with this, especially in the bad emotions. And you don't have to go there with someone. If someone shares something and it's that they're very angry or frustrated, or you, they're just you're sensing it or seeing it, you can say, go back to that Brene Brown video, that looks really hard. It looks like you're in a really hard spot right now. Um, you don't have to fix it and you don't have to accept it or that you did something that you're the cause of it. Um, yeah, I, th I think we have to be careful with that, that, how much we take on. 
So we have to help this public high school teacher. So yes. Kidsbridge is zooming in um, to Trenton and some of the classes are, the teachers are stretched very thin. They might be teaching in person while teaching remotely at the same time. So we hear you. So these kids are very stressed and anxious. The ACE scores, which is adverse childhood experiences scores for trauma are going up. Mm -hmm. um, and Kathleen, you can think too, but what I would suggest is to start the day with something fun, engaging, have them want to come to the classroom to either share something about themselves, although high schoolers may not want to share. You could try the census thing or a game or something that lets them let the stress out. I mean, we actually have like volcano breaths and the kids are moving and jumping up and down to get the yagas out and they they like that. But it's it's nice to strike a chord that you care about them and to let them just that energy um, let it out. Maybe diaries because the kids are really stressed. They could share or not share. Oh, Kathleen, you have any um, ideas? I'm thinking music. High schoolers, I'm thinking music. Something that connects them, um, you know, jazz music. When I, I taught sixth grade for a few years, literature, and I used to just play music in the background to set a mood. You know how, you know, you can be in a really bad mood and you just hear certain kinds of music and it relaxes you or energizes you. When I walk on the treadmill, I listen to really crazy dance music because it gets me going, you know, if, even if you're tired. So finding some music and asking them for input. What would make you feel calm when you get to school? Sometimes what we think as adults, um, again, put yourself in their shoes. What would make you feel calm? Maybe it's five minutes of just silence where they can just sit in peace because all the time we've spent in our houses in the last three years, there hasn't been a lot of quiet in my house. I don't know about your house, um, but there's been a lot of people in my house. <laughs> One more and, tip for high yeah. schoolers, middle elementary is drawing. Yes. So I just saw on PBS this wonderful teacher that the kids really look forward to her. She makes it fun, really, guys. I mean, don't forget the fun. Drawing, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes of doodling, sharing or not sharing. We don't want to force kids, but drawing, music, and, and we hope those suggestions are helpful. Shout out to the teachers. Oh, my Absolutely. goodness. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. so hard. Thank you so much. You really are on the front line and and you're creating our future. So we, Kathleen and I teaching, really, really appreciate what you are doing with empathy, a lot of empathy. So I think that brings us exactly to eight yes, o'clock. Please yes, don't forget the resources and the tips and I'll throw it back to Susan Conlin, Princeton Public Library. Thank you. Thank you, what a wonderful program. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Lynn Azarki, Kathleen McGacken, thank you. Great presentation. We look forward to working with you again in the future, connecting with kids, families, teachers, and our community. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Be well.